Tomorrow is Valentine's Day, so I just want to say happy Valentine's Day to us nerds. I hope nobody is getting in trouble with their partner by being here tomorrow. Um, you know, uh, for me, this is the f expression my husband made when he realized that he doesn't have to plan anything special. <laughs> uh, anyway, I am Ksenia Coulter, and I'm here from the Washington Post talking about all the different ways that we implement AMP on our platform. Um, so I said I work for the Washington Post, but more specifically, I work on ARC Publishing. While Washington Post is a recognizable name, not everybody knows yet about our software as a service part of the business. Um, our platform is a suite of products that addresses various needs of publishers all around the world, from content creation to image and video management to workflow management and much more. Uh, so this diagram kind of gives you an idea of the context of all the products we're balancing and what it may mean when we say, yes, we support AMP on our platform. Uh, so don't get too intimidated. We'll go into details. This is just an overview. Uh, some of the clients that uh, are on the AMP, or I'm sorry, on ARC right now, or will be in the future, uh, Infobuy is a one of the largest Spanish-speaking media based out of Argentina. We just signed La Parisienne. Uh, go <laughs> great for the team that gets to go and vi visit Paris for work, you know. <laughs> uh, Tronc, you may recognize as the umbrella for LA Times, New York Daily News, and Ch Chicago Tribune. Um, so let's talk a little bit about just Infobuy for a second. This is what I've been working on. This was our oldest partner that been very excited about adopting all the no new technology, including AMP and PWA. Uh, so they have 45 million unique visitors per month. And 78% of those come from uh, mobile, and only 22 from desktop. And in Latin America, it's really important to have fast mobile experience, not only because people are accessing it through mobile, but also because there are more connectivity issues there. Um, and 50% of traffic comes from direct traffic, but that also means that 50% of their traffic comes from organic search. And 20% of that is AMP traffic. And AMP is really important for a company like Infobuy because it uh, brings in new unique users, and each new unique user is an opportunity to develop an engaged audience. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how AMP works on the ARC platform. So our API called ARC Native Specification, and as for short, uh, it's an API that takes in content from any CMS, like WordPress or our own CMS solution, Ellipsis, and turns it into more general content elements. You know, images are their own content elements that come with height and width and all the information that you need for them, such separate from such elements as paragraphs or videos or embeds. So historically, our rendering engine page builder has been using Java server pages to render uh, HTML. It's a little bit of an older technology, but what that means is that we don't have to do anything special to server side render HTML, which works really well with AMP. We are working on making uh, it on towards being able to use any templating language or framework for HTML, but so far, JSPs actually work really well with AMP. So each individual feature has a type, and some features can have a type of AMP type. Most of them are default. Another example would be mobile or RSS. So when a user lands on an AMP page, only the features that specify an AMP output type will display. So that eliminates any need for uh, curating AMP templates separate from just your regular pages. Uh, you can still do that, but you don't have to. So we use features a little bit differently, I think, than other people. So I just wanted to quickly explain what a feature is. So this would be the headline feature that comes with a media 
Uh, in this case, it's a video. Um, this is a feature of trending topics, and this is a feature that pulls latest from a particular category. So you can see how a web page consists of these little bits and pieces, and each one can be made AMP compatible or not. So if you imagine that latest from business has to make an API call or something like that, and maybe there's other things involved in making AMP, AMP compatible, if this feature doesn't yet support AMP, it just won't appear. OK, so some of the challenges of implementing AMP are, of course, CSS size. Keeping your CSS under those 50 kilobytes can be pretty hard. Um, sanitization, because we work with so many different CMS uh, from publishers all over the world, you know, New Zealand, Latin America, Europe, US. Some of our partners even had print-first CMS that's not even online first. Uh, it comes with its own challenges, and we have adapters that are doing a lot of work, uh, but sometimes things slip by, so sanitization is really important. Um, Third-party integrations, we often don't have a lot of control over that. And again, because we work with people from all over the world, maybe they want a specific like sports score provider that we have never worked with before and maybe doesn't really support AMP, ads, all of that. Um, platform support. So as you've seen, we have a lot of products that we support. So when we say we support AMP, it means that eventually all of our products have to be playing nicely with AMP. So let's talk a little bit about CSS. I know we probably have all seen this. You know, to a lot of developers already hate having to uh, work too much with CSS. <laughs> um, so here's kind of all the different ways you can think about implementing CSS on AMP pages. Uh, the first one is you can have completely separate CSS files, and maybe that approach works better uh, when you've already built an entire site and then the client wants AMP support, you didn't think about it, okay, let's just put it in a different CSS file. It's really easy to implement, but it's really hard to maintain and kind of goes against the principle of editing one thing in one place only and not having to do the same change in multiple places. Um, one AMP compliant file, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> uh, that is a great solution if you can actually get all the CSS that you need for your entire site under those 50 kilobytes. So it's pretty hard to implement, but it is easy to maintain. And this hybrid version that we kind of settled on for one of our newer clients, they knew from the beginning that they wanted to support AMP. So our team built bootstrap-like type of fr framework for our internal use, and all of the elements in that framework are AMP compliant. And then when the limit was approached, you know, we got closer and closer to 50 kilobytes, we decided that certain features that do not need to appear on AMP can have their own special CSS. And that way, it's AMP first. And then maybe a couple features that will not appear on AMP will have their own CSS. And that's, that's been really good for um, thinking about AMP first. Implementation, you know, it's medium, and maintenance is pretty easy. So sanitization. Our platform is CMS agnostic. So as I've mentioned before, we work with all sorts of CMS that we have to convert to our own API format. And sometimes, you know, each client content is unique little snowflake. And here's the things, you know, we sometimes have to take out. Style and on-click, we all know that. Uh, but I've also encountered things like shape equals rectangle. You know, had to dig around, and it's basically an ancient HTML attribute that we don't usually see anymore. Target new instead of target blank. This runtime topic tag has been inserted by an analytics uh, engine into the CF, uh, HTML for one of our clients. So some of these things you can kind of anticipate, but things like that you really can't. 
So sanitization ends up being a lot of work because each client is going to bring something new to the table, and you're going to learn something that makes AMP angry. Um, so this is a, a piece of the file that does sanitization, where you're looking for non-compliant elements and stripping them out. And actually, here, this is embedded Java, because JSV doesn't handle a lot of uh, regular express expressions well. So you end up having front-end developers writing Java code, which is not great. Um, sometimes you know, I feel like that robot. Um, Third-party integrations can be pretty hard. Um, for example, this, we had to incorporate this new sports score module that's an embed. And on the provider site, it has the section said AMP imp implementation. And all it does is provide a link to AMP iframe documentation. That's it. Just one line. Read about AMP iframe. Uh, so things like that can be out of our control. And it's, you know, sometimes the decision is to strip it out. Well, that leads to a degraded experience for uh, the reader. So it's a hard thing to balance. Saying all that, tools do make our lives easier. Uh, for one of our projects, we have a Circle CI and Web, Webpack setup that fails any build that approaches that 50 kilobyte limit. I think it's 48.5, if I remember correctly. But this is really great because it's automatic. Nobody you know, fails you on your PR. Uh, you don't have to be mad at a coworker. Instead, a machine tells you, no, go refactor. So that actually works really well because the developer can either go and refactor their CSS or utilize the classes and SAS mixins that are already there. Uh, it kind of encourages best practices in CSS writing. AMP validator is a really useful tool. It gives mostly very helpful messages with help, very helpful links. And of course, the Google Search Console that kind of gives you a more broad overview of what's going wrong. And that really helps prioritize which uh, validation failing errors you're going to fix first. Because if one affects 30,000 stories, then you know, you're probably going to tackle that first. So let's zoom out a little bit. Arc Publishing is more than just its rendering engine. And when we talk about support for AMP on our platform, we have to consider the products we have. For example, Arc.io provides different types of feeds for native apps, RSS, Facebook Instant Articles. It also supports AMP. That is actually how the WashingtonPost.com does it. The, instead of on the front end doing the rendering of AMP compliant elements, there's a Python script that uh, does the same thing on the back end and creates this uh, HTML blob that the WashingtonPost.com uses, but that is more of a custom solution for the Washington Post with our clients. You know, having it be through these front-end little modular features really helps because then any client uh, can have a very custom AMP experience. Um, so platform approach means that we also have to support Clavis, our AI-driven personalization engine that needs to figure out how to run AMP-compliant script and produce AMP-compliant HTML for recommended stories. Um, so Clavis is our topic classifier. Um, so here's an example. It uses natural, process, uh, na natural language processing to categorize a story. Here we see a story about NASA, and it's going to categorize it as airspace and aviation. Uh, it is also um, a targeting tool. It builds a user profile based on what stories user clicks on um, and gives you all that information. And there's also a hybrid functionality where it recommends stories based on popularity of content, user interests, or group behavior. So with AMP, you can imagine that it's pretty hard to do the tracking because Right now, everything is happening on the Google domain, and we just can't do that. And since it is a data-driven model, there's a lot of information that is being missed there. You know, what if AMP users use uh, the website completely differently? What if they have different interests? We don't have that information right now. So 
the announcement that we can host AMP pages on our own domain is really welcome to us. Uh, and it can definitely help us with tracking. Uh, so Clavis on the Washington Post just calls inside an iframe to, to an iframe hosted by this recommendation in, engine. And it's really just uh, AMP compliant HTML blob. And this is kind of what it looks like if you go on WashingtonPost.com. This is, this is produced by Clavis. So, the AMP support for all clients is in progress right now uh, because this type of approach you know, is not very customizable right now. Um, another part that I wanted to talk to you about is Ellipsis, our render agnostic CMS. Uh, as you've seen today, AMP stories have been launched. And actually, um, because Ellipsis is used to create stories for Washington Post and our clients. You know, we wanted to create a nice way for them to be able to create AMP stories uh, inside of our CMS. So the team that worked on this, because there was a time constraint, decided that instead of trying to fit it into the Ellipsis roadmap, that they're going to use uh, a Google Chrome plugin. So the Google Chrome plugin spruces up the editor and makes it more clear where like, each AMP stamp, AMP story, uh, is separated from another. So here's a video. Let's play it real quick. Uh, so this is our editor. You can see that right now, maybe it's not super clear what's going to be part of which stamp. Now that you reload with the Chrome plugin, you see these dotted lines that clearly designate where the content is going to go. On the right, you can see you can drag in image or heading. It adds this, add another stamp, add background to the stamp. Uh, this is our image management system. Um, Yep, so adding another heading. And then when you save, you get a little preview. And this is what it looks like. Yum. Waiting for lunch, right? OK, so I, I would really like to thank everyone who worked on this. Matt Callahan, Linda Williams, Joe Price, Christopher Kinkle, Deb Doss, and Simon Glenn Gregg. Let's have a round of applause for them. A lot of them are here today, so make sure to find them if you have any questions about this. Um, so looking a little bit into the future, um, newsroom tools for AMP validation. So some of our clients want to be able to tell if a certain embed that they're putting in a story is going to be invalid in AMP, and then to be able to make that decision whether they want that story to not appear in that AMP carousel at all, or can they sacrifice this embed, or can they find a better way to convey this information that is not going to break AMP validation? Um, holistic platform support. So all of our products, AMP will be part of the roadmap, getting it there and supporting it from every side, uh, tracking, analytics, feeds, everything. And then AMP stories for everyone. As you've seen with the Google plugin, we'd really like to have that as part of the native functionality uh, in the Ellipsis so all of our clients can create their AMP stories. So I would like to thank uh, James Ives, Will Wanweiser, Molly Gannon, and Simon Glenn Gregg for working with me on this and giving me their part of the puzzle of how AMP is being implemented on the Washington Post. And my name is Ksenia Coulter. You can find me on Twitter at KSColt. Uh, please, I will be off to the side. Come and ask me any questions if you're interested. Um, and that's it for me. Thanks. <laughs>